When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory, Jesus, died, it demands my life, my soul, and my all. Hoping that's where we are this morning or we can get there as quickly as possible. I want to read a passage uh, for you, and we're going to actually take communion uh, together here before we go into our Bible message, you know, today. And so if you're at home, and we know many of you are, are in other places watching via live stream, uh, now's the time to be able to make your preparations for uh, communion. Hopefully it hasn't been an afterthought. It's something that you've thought about and it's important to you and your life because it was so important to the early church and in the scriptures. And uh, before we talk about uh, and continue on in our series on life-giving relationships, all of life as a disciple of Jesus flows through Christ. And that's why Paul says, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. And that our life is, is hidden with Christ in God. If then you've been raised with Christ, referring to the baptism in Colossians chapter 2, Colossians 3 goes on and says, if you've been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on the things above, not on earthly things, for you died. And your life is now hidden with Christ in God, and we continue to try to mature to be able for those statements to be more and more a reality in, uh, in our life. And so before we actually get into our Bible study and our scriptural exhortation and message today, uh, let's, let's share communion together. And I'd like us to focus on a passage in Colossians because we're going to look at a couple of key passages in Colossians that relate to our life-giving relationships with each other. But let's uh, first of all take a look at the 30,000 foot level, you know, how God is trying to help raise our eyes off of this situation that we live in day to day and put our, our, our minds and our hearts on the things that are above. Um, let's, uh, let's get prepared to read Colossians chapter 1, verse 15. He is the in image of the invisible God. He is the firstborn of creation. We're obviously talking about Jesus. For everything was created by him in heaven and on earth, the things that are visible, things that are invisible. And whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before everything. And by him, all things hold together. And he's also head of the body, his body, the church. And so what we do um, each Sunday as a church, we actually celebrate the, the cross of Jesus. We celebrate uh, what we call the Lord's Supper or the communion you know, service. And I, I'd like to invite you to take out this uh, sort of uh, little convenient uh, bread and juice that we, we provide for you here and at home, of course, you're making your, your preparations there. In, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, when Paul talks about taking communion. He's talking about taking it together as a body. And we do it in gatherings like this. We do it in smaller groups in our homes. We do it in sometimes house church settings. And we'll be doing more and more of that in the months to come. But the idea is it's not just you and God. It's something we do together. And so when you read in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, the thought is that you take note and consider the needs of the people that are around you. And so we do it as a body. We celebrate it. But on the other hand, it's maybe the most intimate moment of your week. When, when you take in your hands, I want to invite you to do this right now. Just open up this little plastic uh, uh, if you're here in the auditorium, and take, out an, and take out the piece of bread right now. Because here's what the Bible says, that uh, when they were together on that last night, together it says that Jesus took a loaf of bread and he did something with it. Do you remember? He broke it. And he said, this is going to signify my body that's going to be broken for you on the cross. And remember, when you, you take this bread, remember that. And likewise, he did that with the cup that he had. So I want to encourage, I'm going to say a prayer. And uh, right before I say the prayer, I'd like to encourage you to break this little, you know, piece of unleavened bread 
and to be able to think about Jesus being broken for you and for me and for our families. And let's do what the Bible says to examine ourselves, make sure we don't take the body and the blood of the Lord or what represents it in an unworthy manner. Amen? All right, let me say a prayer and then we'll have that communion, well, celebration, as well as a, uh, uh, a beautiful reminder of what was done for us beyond what we could ever do for ourselves. Father in heaven, we are praying to you right now, and we're, we're saying at the same time, thank you in celebrating this great sacrifice. We don't deserve it. Can't even believe that it's real sometimes, the thought that you care that much about us specifically to allow your son to, to die, to be tortured, to be torn apart. And as we take this bread, we're acknowledging that. We're acknowledging the cross and what you did that we could not do for ourselves. And through the blood that uh, it was represented for us in this communion service by this juice, how thankful can we never, ever, ever thank you enough for the blood of Jesus cleansing all of our sins completely away that we can be pure in your sight even though we're struggling here on earth you know, in our, own, or in our own lives. Thank you, Lord. We, we, we take this bread, we take this juice in honor of Jesus and in deep gratitude to you. Amen. All right, we're continuing our, our series on um, life-giving relationships, and today we're focusing in on life-giving nutheteo, and we'll explain what that means in just a little bit. We can go to that slide where we give the overview of Colossians, because we're going to look at a couple of more verses that lead us in to this one another way. Now, the way the, the Bible is, uh, is organized so often, particularly in the New Testament, is in many of the epistles you have sort of a 30,000-foot view, and we just read an example of that about how big and great and awesome this plan of God is, and it's all about God and what He did for us that we can't do for ourselves. And in this uh, sense of, of Colossians, we're saying it's the supremacy of Christ. But then what happens in Colossians, you're very familiar with the pattern in Ephesians, Romans, etc., will go on to submission to Christ, which involves our day-to-day -day life in following Jesus, and it involves are one another relationships with each other because uh, uh, sort of new students of the Bible or people who are coming to explore the Scriptures in a deeper way than they have before, they get surprised to, to see how many of the verses in the New Testament that are written to us that are already in a church or have become Christians or considering it have to do with our one another relationships. There are just dozens and dozens of them. And what actually gives us life is God's Spirit we're motivated and transformed by His Word and by His grace, but our relationships with one another give life to us. They add energy to us, and they help mature us in Christ. And it's so clear through the Scriptures in Ephesians, it talks about how God has given gifts to the church that are elders and, 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 and teachers and evangelists and, of course, you know, apostles before them. And the idea is so the church can be equipped and mature. But then there's this concept in verse 15 of chapter 4 of Ephesians that speaking the truth in, do you remember? Speaking the truth in love, we help each other mature. And so there's this idea in our relationships, we're able to help each other grow in Christ, meet each other's needs, and it's a beautiful way that God put all of this together. Uh, as we move on to 1 Thessalonians, we're going to be talking about this over the next several weeks, about some different uh, one another, uh, I don't know if you want to call them functions, responsibilities, opportunities, privileges, however you want to frame it. But illustrated in this one verse in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, there's this idea that uh, we need each other to help admonish us, to encourage us, to um, help us, and for people to be patient with us. And so we're actually going to take some of these concepts and spend a few minutes in the next uh, uh, couple of weeks, two or three weeks, and talk about how we do that in each other's lives. Let's go back to Colossians, okay? Because we're going to introduce you, some of you, uh, for the first time to a, uh, a Greek word. It's nutheteo, and that's why we've entitled this Life-Giving Relationships or Life-Giving Nutheteo. Now, um, this is going to be 
uh, something you're going to want to take home, whether you do it with your own notes or you double back on uh, live stream or on the website, and you go over these scriptures and you think it through, because you're going to need to do some application on this. But we're doing a deep dive this morning on just one Greek word and how it appears in the epistles that are written to us on growing in Christ, you know, close to a dozen times. The, um, so in Colossians 1, here's how, here's how Paul framed it as he introduces this word and this concept to us. Uh, we just talked about how Jesus is the image of the invisible God, how amazing he is. And then Paul goes on to say, we proclaim him, him we proclaim, and he uses these participles to describe how he works with the church, me and you, to help us mature. He says, uh, him we proclaim, admonishing, our, it's our word nuthateoing one another, and teaching each other, didasco, uh, admonish each other, and teaching each other, uh, so we may present everyone fully mature in Christ. We're just assuming this morning that none of us are fully mature in Christ yet and like Jesus. And so Paul says, here's what I do. I proclaim Christ by admonishing and teaching the church and all of us together. He, we'll look at the next phrase. With all of the energy I've got, I strenuously contend with all this energy as Christ works powerfully in me. So it's quite clear. As Paul thinks about me and you, as the apostle and the scriptures are written down, there, there's, there's a, a, a way that, that we're able to mature and grow from a human level. And that is through admonishing and teaching by those in our life. Now, here's interesting. As we go on in Colossians in chapter 3 and verse 16, it's, it's obvious it's not just church leaders or a certain category of Christians that are involved in this, but it's something for all of us to be able to uh, participate with each other. And so it tells us, let the message of Christ dwell in you richly, okay? Richly as opposed to, you know, poorly, superficially, not deeply, okay? Have you noticed that when you do your Bible study and you read and you have the message of Christ, sometimes it kind of goes really deep inside of you and other times it kind of, you know, kind of bounces off doesn't do that much. And just like a plant, you got to get those roots to go down deep, okay, in order to have a strong, healthy, you know, plant. And so he says, as the Word of Christ dwells in you, let it dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish each other in all wisdom. So as we let the Word of Christ dwell in us richly, we do pray, we do fast, we do meditate, we do get time to reflect. It's really important to let it go down deep, but we also use the Word of God with each other to help each other to teach us and admonish us together. Do you see that? That's important for you to see it and to embrace it, whether it's something that is a big part of your life or not partly, hardly part of your life at all. It is God's plan. It's how we help each other mature and grow. And I think as we go through some more of these passages and you understand the concept, particularly of nutheteo or admonishing as it's translated, it's translated several ways. We'll get into that in a moment. We basically understand the idea of teaching. And that's the other word that is, is used here, teaching or the word didasco. I'll show you the Greek word on that in a minute. But teaching Didasco, which we get the word didactic and other, other words, it appeals to the intellect. Socrates used this uh, Greek word all the time. And uh, we do need teaching. We need material. We need information. We need things to help us understand, put things together. It's important. The role of teachers, huge in our world, and it always has been. But then there's also the sense of needing more than just teaching, to be taught or told what to do, but to be able to, be, to get some help along the way. Now, it's, it's, it's really interesting. I want you to get a concept here. I think if we go to our next, uh, if we go to our next slide, uh, there's a word in the, in the New Testament, parakaleo, and these words you're going to look at, they're not that complicated once you get uh, familiar with them. What parakaleo means is para alongside and kaleo to call. It's, it's to call alongside, and it's the word that's translated in our English Bible, encourage. Can you think of some passages that tell us to encourage each other? How often? 
Well, daily. Hebrews chapter 3, 12 uh, and 13 would be one example. Uh, let, uh, he says, see to it that none of you develops a bad heart that drifts away from God, but instead encourage each other. And what's the, the next word? Daily, as long as it's called today. In other words, not tomorrow, but right now. Everybody needs daily encouragement. Did you know that? Even you, you hardened John Wayne, you know, whoever you are out there who thinks you can, you know, ride into the sunset on your own, know you need encouragement. Great athletes need encouragement. Husbands need encouragement. And our children need encouragement multiple times a day. So, as we talk about these life-giving relationships, their uh, encouragement, parakaleo, to call alongside encourage, it's, it's, it's cool in the Greek, it's used of a, uh, a general sending somebody out to the troops when they're not doing well and they're getting tired and losing, and to fire them up, back up, and to encourage them. It's like a coach at halftime, you know, going in when you're down a touchdown, you know, or, or 10 points, to come on guys, we can do this. And we all understand, it. and we, here's the thing, we need it daily, and we need to offer it daily, Amen. That's a different lesson, but it's important to note. That's daily. Then there's the, uh, the concept of teaching. And I think if we can go on to that slide. I think we've got one on Didasco that provides instruction, whether formal or informal, and it appeals to the mind. And many of us are oriented this way, engineers in particular. Steve, my friend Steve Atkins, you know, it's very important, you know, to have that kind of information, okay, and to appeal to that intellect and to put things together in, uh, in that way. And so, yes, it is important in our small groups, our family groups, not just in an hour here on Sunday morning, to teach each other, open the Scriptures with each other, even teach and share each other's uh, wisdom, but also there's this concept of nuthateo and admonishing, you know, each other. So I want us to take a look at this uh, word. If we go on to the next uh, thing, nuthateo. It's from two words, nu, which is mind, your mind, nu, and tethemi, which is to put. It's a verb. So literally, it's to put something on a brother or sister's mind. And here's what it, it's, it's translated several different ways in the 10 or 11 times it occurs in the New Testament. It's translated to admonish. It's translated to counsel. It's translated to instruct. And it's, it's, uh, it's translated to warn. It's a nuanced word. You can't uh, define it just with one English word because depending on the context, there's some, there's some levels to it you know, that accelerate, you know, as, you know, as needed. And so, you know, as we said here, it literally means to put it on your mind or to give some warning or notice beforehand of some danger, you know, that's coming up. And it, here this is really important. It's not just influencing the intellect. It's influencing with each other our emotions and our will. And this is what the, the Scriptures say. That's what the Scriptures do. You know, they're profitable to be able to, to do that. And in our one another relationships, the Bible's going to tell us, it's in our last verse today, that uh, the, uh, the apostles say, I'm confident that church are full of goodness and wisdom, and you are competent to nuthateo one another, and most of the translations say counsel you know one another. You're competent to be in there and to help each other. You don't have to have an elder. You don't have to have a bishop. You don't have to have some, uh, you know, PhD to be able to do it. You've got the Holy Spirit in the Scriptures, and you can help each other in, uh, you know, in this way. And Newt the Tale describes like putting some sense into people's head is how one of the uh, commentators talked about it, and alerting to them of serious consequences. I have gotten a lot of nuthateos, or as like the campus likes to call them, nuth bombs, you know. I've gotten them through the years um, because I, get, uh, I was a worthy uh, recipient, you know, or needed it. And um, because I'm, I'm like one of these guys, um, well, well here, here's, here's, a, here's the spirit of nuthateo, okay. It's the spirit of the book of Proverbs. You know how it talks about iron sharpens iron and one man sharpens another, one man sharpens another, Right? And it talks about this concept of, of appreciating and receiving a life-giving rebuke. Now, that's a step above an admonishment, okay? But there's this sense of appreciating it. And I'm wondering, how many of you from memory could quote Proverbs chapter 12, verse 1 from this great book of wisdom? 
Proverbs 12, 1. How many can, you know, can quote it? We didn't put it up on the screen because it was a little bit of a quiz. Maybe note that because it's a good one. And I'll simply quote it for you. He who loves discipline loves knowledge. But he who hates to be corrected is stupid. Stupid. <laughs> now, the Bible doesn't call us stupid often, except it tells us we're stupid sheep and so kind of naturally stupid, you know, in, in some things. But here's what, this is the spirit of it. Those who hate our, uh, correction, who hate to be corrected, the Bible says they're stupid. That, that's wow. I mean, that's like, that's, let's, that's a new thetao. That's an admonishment. And here's the thing. Although we can really appreciate, um, and this is the first part of the verse, he who loves discipline loves knowledge, whereas we can actually love to get corrected in certain things to be able to help us grow. And we can appreciate it. Almost none of us like it. Can you agree with that? I mean, it's just almost impossible to like it. You know, when we're corrected and we get admonished, sometimes even if it's in the most gentle, you know, of ways. The, the thing that I remember, uh, my most memorable in my early days of a nuthateo or an admonishment I was single, and um, I was dating. At the time, I was dating uh, Kelly. And uh, the, the other people in my life, I'm probably 22, 23 years old, and uh, they, um, they felt like I was, I was pretty, uh, I didn't really listen to counsel and advice. Let's put it that way. And I seemed to resist it. And I can be charming, and so I know how to be charming. Oh, I really appreciate that and do absolutely nothing with it, you know, like some of you. And so uh, that was frustrating some of the guys in my life. And it was frustrating my girlfriend because Kelly was wanting me, who's now my wife, thank you, Jesus. You know, she was encouraging me, you need to talk to the brothers more about our relationship and about our dating and how you can lead it. And some of the things, you know, like coming over at, at, at midnight and throwing rocks at my sorority, I'm not sure that's cool, you know. And I'm going like, no, I just, no, I don't need to do that. I mean, you know, I'm just being friendly. You know, and you know, you know that, that sort of thing. And um, it, it went on, it got worse. And I, I developed a hardness in my heart that was, was obvious. And I kept uh, people, even though I was quite active in the church, but kept people at an arm's distance. And I just said, I did not seriously want anybody telling me what to do. That just did not want that. Let me figure it out on my, you know, you know on my own. And yet a woman wants to have a relationship with a guy who's humble and is willing to listen and willing to learn. And so I remember we went out, uh, uh, we had a meal together, and we were struggling in our relationship. And then, uh, you, you know, Kelly was giving me counsel and advice, and I thought she was coming on too, too much. And I, um, I, I, I said, Kelly, here's the thing. Come on, just lighten up. I... I'm really a good person. If I, if I weren't even a Christian, I'd still be a good person. <laughs> While she loaded and took aim and fired a howitz, howitzer of a nuke bomb, nuke the toe, and she looked at me in the eye and she said, Tom, you are gross without the Lord. Now, my customary way back then, I went, oh, see, that, that, yeah, that, that, that's the point. You're just way overboard on everything. I was la, 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 la. But it was really true. I was kind of undermining everything about Christianity, that somehow I'm good enough and I can do it on my own and go my own way. And I got, I, I, that, that was a strong nuthateo I will, you know, I'll, I'll always remember. The thing, about, um, the thing about admonishment, you know, in our lives, it is a very nuanced thing. I, I think that, um, I think it's a good thing to pause and ask ourselves, am I coachable? as a disciple. Am I coachable? Am I teachable? I mean, what do you do with a young athlete who's not coachable? It's a challenge. They end up hurting themselves and end up hurting the team. And the, uh, this idea of that we need each other to teach each other and counsel each other is really important. I'm going to just run through some quick, you know, scriptures. I actually, I, you know, I went to the trouble of doing this. So I want to put it up. Anybody remember commercials from the 70s? That's an interesting lead in, right? They were really curious. They were really interesting. And they were kind of fun. 
And to illustrate this point, because the idea with a nuthateo is everybody from time to time needs to have something put on their mind and, and uh, hey, think about this. Are you thinking this through, you know, enough and getting the help that you need? And there was a commercial back then for something called Menin Skin Bracer. Do you, anybody remember that? And it ended up with, with, with uh, the, the phrase was, thanks, I needed that. And we're going to play a little clip here because even smoking Joe Frazier needed a little new to tell. All right. America wakes up with Skin Bracer. Eggs. I needed that. If you need waking up, slap on some bracer. Its skin tightener and chin chillers can help you come out smoking. Thanks. I needed that. Hey, we all need a little pop from time to time. Uh, and we're not talking about a slap in the face. We're, we're talking about a reminder. Hey, think about this. See, the, the Bible is, is really full of this. It's in Old Testament, New Testament. You remember Nathan and David, you know, where Nathan came up to David and he told him a story and he asked him a question. And then he said, you are the man. And he just, you know, looked right at him. And that was a nuthato. You remember with Jesus. He did this frequently, you know, with the disciples. He would tell parables, parable of the Good Samaritan. He'd ask a question, who is the neighbor? And then he'd pop, hey, you go and do likewise. Rich young ruler, etc. Peter and John chapter 21, do you love me? There are many times, and this is not harsh. You just got to understand, this is not harsh. It can be exceptionally gentle, you know, but it's not almost saying something. It's, it's, it's addressing something and frequently with a question. It, it's, it's a word, if we go to the next slide, you know, uh, it, it's used, I'm just in, doing this so you can write it in your notes in 1 Corinthians 10, it's used in the sense of instruction, nuthateo, but instruction, again, not to the intellect, but to the will and the emotion. And as we go into the next passage, it's actually, nuthateo is a family word. We all recognize this if we've had kids. And so Paul here, as he uses this word nuthateo, or to admonish, he said, I'm not writing this to shame you. And this is very important when sometimes we receive input or receive correction. The idea is not to make us feel guilty or to make us feel ashamed, but to help us think through something. Maybe we haven't spent enough time thinking through. And he said, I became your father, you know, in, uh, you know, in the gospel, but he, he's writing this to nuthateo them, or they translate it, warned there. In the, in the next passage, in Ephesians, in this passage where we're talking about husband-wife relationships and fathers raising their kids, here's something that's said to the dads and the granddads. Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Is that possible, guys? Your father maybe exasperates you a few times. Maybe. And so it's, it, it said, don't do that, but rather bring them up in the training and the nuthateo of the Lord. This is instruction in the sense of helping our kids. Now, we know our kids, do they need a lot of encouragement? They do like us. Okay, I want to leave you with a, with, with a thought here. Nutha, you know, parakaleo is daily. Didascular teaching is often. Nuthatel is just as needed, okay? It's not like a daily, you know, type of, type of thing. But every parent knows kids need encouragement. Do they ever need an admonishment? Would you think it'd be any different with us as, you know, as God's children? And I was talking, I see Emma over there because she's one of my favorite kids to see. She and Nora are there, and they're awesome in church, and they sing and they dance, and it's, it's, you know, it's really awesome. And so I was talking to Chase about it, and I asked him, so, so Chase, do you, uh, do you expect Emma to make up her own bed? She's six years old, you know, at some point. And he said, yeah. And so let me give you an example of Nuthatel as it goes through these different degrees, okay? And all of these are used in the Scripture. So, you know, we could be, there's some teaching and so Chase and Sarah might go, Emma, you know, in our house, we make up our bed before we, we come out of the room, and you're a big girl now, and so we're going to do that. Okay, that's some teaching, right? You've explained it there. And then there's, uh, and then there's the, uh, the question, uh, Emma, ha have you made up your bed yet? Even though you may sort of know that she hasn't, but it's a question. It's probing a little bit uh, deeper. And then maybe a statement, Emma, remember to make your bed right? You're putting it to mind, okay? And then at some point it becomes, Emma Jane, make your bed. 
That would be a nice full-on admonishment, okay? And then, of course, at some point you go, you know, Emma or any of our kids, if you continue not to obey mommy and daddy, that's going to affect your TV time, and we're going to take some of those stuffed animals. <laughs> Every parent understands this. And this is how it works in our relationships. And you need a lot of wisdom and judgment on this. And as we go to this, you know, in this next slide, you know, um, the, uh, it's another one on warning. Paul says, I spent three years admonishing you as he was raising up the elders. And we keep on going, trying to give you all the examples of this. And, uh, and here's the strong warning. It even gets to the point in the church because God hates division. If somebody's causing division, you warn them once, and then you warn them again, nuthateo. This is death con five, nuthateo. And uh, don't regard them as an enemy, but warn them as you would a fellow believer. Actually, that's, that, that's a little bit less. And then we go to the next one. Titus is this one that uh, have nothing to do with them if they continue in that state. So you can see, it can be a very strong word, always loving, or it can be a gentle, you know, kind of counsel or encouragement or reminder. It's, it's nuanced. And, and it, it takes judgment with this. And I think our next verse illustrates that as I'm getting ready to wrap this up now. Because these are things um, that we need to be part of of our life, and we'll be talking about them in the next couple of weeks. Here's what the Apostle Paul says. I urge you, brothers and sisters, admonish the idle, encourage the disheartened or the, the, the timid, help the weak, and be patient with them all. Do you see the need for judgment? Do you see the need for wisdom? Because as we do this with each other, we have to have discernment. If, if, if somebody, are they idle? Or are they just discouraged or timid? Or are they, they're just weak and they need some practical help on this? But the thing you want to be able to see, this is part of our church life together. And the key thing is be patient with everybody, right? It's like 1 Peter 4, 8. Above all else, love each other deeply from the heart, because love covers a multitude of sin. Absolutely the trump card is love, and prayer, and really being patient with each other. I got another great video I'd like to show you, but I'm not, so email me. Let me fire it off to you. But how about, yeah, how about a concluding, you know, scripture here? How do you learn this judgment on how to know how to help each other. Well, according to two verses beforehand, you allow that to happen to yourself. That you look over and you notice, you know, those who work hard among you and are over in the Lord and care for you and admonish you, you know, esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Do you agree? All of us ought to have somebody in our life that we look up to and we appreciate their spirituality and their hard work and we allow them to be involved in our life and admonish us or question us or give us counsel. I just, uh, for me, my heart to, to yours, I wish I hadn't resisted it so much in my youth. It really hurt me in my purity. It really hurt me in my marriage, you know, for, you know, for many years. If I had simply really listened, and I get very nervous, personally concerned, as an older brother to most of you, if you're single, that you don't let somebody in there into your space of how you're thinking about the opposite sex and how you're dealing with that area in your life, your purity, etc. I get really nervous about married couples who, who have a little fence around them and you really don't invite anybody in your life to you just talk about how you're doing. You know, it's so important more than anything else. So this is biblical. It's scriptural. So take these verses, dissect them. This has not been a sermon of inspiration, particularly. It's been a sermon of nuthateo. Please don't blow these scriptures off and work on how you can implement them in your life, in your small group, in your relationships, because the Bible has a lot of confidence in us, and it's our last scripture here, as the Apostle Paul says to the church in Rome, and he doesn't really know the church that well, but he says, I'm convinced, guys, I'm convinced, brothers and sisters, that you are, in fact, full of good, uh, goodness and wisdom, and you are competent to counsel one another 
or with this Greek word, you are competent to counsel, to nuthateo one another. Why? So we can all mature and become more and more like Jesus in His church.